So part two of my talk is with regards to sequencing and planning uh, of treatment of dissection. So the problem with dissection, as we know, is that it's very complex. And the problem that we run into with malperfusion is, as you can see in this transesophageal echo, you have a true lumen which can get compromised by the false lumen. And so during systole, the true lumen gets smaller. So every time the heart beats, as you can see in this image, the true lumen is getting smaller. So you're actually compromising flow to your end organs during systole, which is exactly the opposite of what you want to do. And so it's important when you're treating these patients to identify the true and the false lumen. And again, <clears throat> it comes back to my talk on uh, imaging, why intravascular ultrasound is so important. So again, it's important to understand that these are sick patients and that it's generally some form of a malperfusion that leads them into this, this, this algorithm where you need to treat them sooner rather than later. In terms of options for therapy, you can treat patients conservatively. And I think today, most patients get some degree of conservative therapy, maximum antihypertensive medication, pain control. A minority of patients are treated with surgery because the risk of death with surgery in acute dissection is very high, except for type A dissection, where there's no other option except to operate. But I think endovascular intervention is by far and away the most important one that you need to understand. And this slide I'll show you a few times because it's so important and it's important because you need to differentiate between a complicated dissection and an uncomplicated dissection. So what is a complicated dissection? A complicated dissection is a dissection where the patient is malperfusing. And that's not based on imaging, that's based on clinical parameters. The patient has an elevated lactate, they have renal function, they have paraplegia, they have no distal pulses. These are all signs of malperfusion. Rupture or impending rupture, that's more an imaging diagnosis. So rupture, we all know it's blood in the mediastinum, you know, hematoma, big pleural effusion. Impending rupture, generally, it's a little bit of a softer sign. And it's often patients who have ongoing persistent pain that we call impending ruptures. Uh, a big aorta is bigger than four and a half centimeters is not a complicated dissection, but it's something that you should at least regard as high risk. Same with uh, early false lumen expansion, patients who are very resistant to blood pressure medication, partial false lumen thrombosis and ongoing pain. The true uncomplicated patients are a small minority who don't have any of these that I've just spoken about and a small aorta. If I have to separate these out, the ones that are in bold, malperfusion and rupture or impending rupture really are the true complicated dissections. And the other ones are what we call high risk and you should treat them sooner rather than later. But there's a very, um, there's a, a sweet spot in terms of when you can treat these patients. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you some examples of how to plan these cases, how to interpret the imaging and how to treat them. So this is a 66 year old male presented with a type A dissection. You can see it's extensive. It is an A11. And I really urge all of you to download the Society of Vascular Surgery consensus paper on terminology for uh, acute dissection, where it, it essentially grades these and, and it teaches you a, a method of describing these dissections. And so this is essentially what we call an A11. So the patient presented with a type A dissection, a decreased right common femoral artery pulse, um, which in itself is malperfusion. And we know that we have to treat these patients with surgery. So type A dissection has to be treated with surgery, but this patient also has malperfusion. So now you come to the situation is how do you sequence these patients? In other words, do you fix the malperfusion first? Because we know that a patient with a type A dissection is going on to bypass, uh, they're getting cooled. This is a five, six hour surgery. You know, if you leave a patient for five or six hours of malperfusion, the chances of them having a good outcome is extremely low. So what was decided in this patient, and again, this is debatable, but this is just an example and it shows you how difficult it is sometimes to, to understand how to treat these patients. So this patient was treated with an AXFEM while they were placing the patient on bypass. And this was only to temporize the common femoral artery pulse. I'll talk about options that you have a little bit later as we go through this case, but you can see here on this uh, CT scan, an extensive dissection, extensive flap going all the way into the aortic root, significant compromise of the true lumen, dissection going into the SMA and the celiac. Here you can see the celiac stenosis. Here's the SMA dissection, extensive dissection to the SMA. 
And so this patient had an ascending repair. They didn't do a crossover. They just did an axfem uh, to the uh, right common femoral artery. In other words, just to bypass this aortic pathology. The argument here is, you know, should you have maybe put at least non-covered dissection stents into the aorta to open up the true lumen and improve that flow, you know, uh, it, while they were setting up this patient for, for open surgery, that is a, a really good point. And yes, that the answer is you could have, but that's what was decided by the clinical team. So if you run through the CT, you can see there's a very extensive dissection, significant compromise of the true lumen and a big, big entry tear. So here you can see what the images look like. So this is a few days later, this patient developed worsening peripheral ischemia. You can see that this patient has an axfem bypass. And as they developed worsening peripheral ischemia, they had a femfem crossover done and fasciotomies done because this patient was developing compartment syndrome. Why were they developing compartment syndrome? Well, it's essentially because they had ongoing malperfusion and ischemia. And so they get swelling in the compartment and they develop compartment syndrome. Again, at this point, you can argue this patient's already had open surgery. They've got an ascending replacement. Could you potentially stent the aortic dissection? And the controversy here is stenting into dissected aorta, which is not something that you really want to do. So because the dissection now is essentially from the origin or the distal suture anastomotic line in the ascending aorta, if you stent this patient, you'll be stenting uh, into dissected aorta, which is essentially a contraindication. And the worry here is if you place too large a stent into this, that you will prefer, pressurize that false lumen. So it's not a decision that you take lightly, but in a patient with ongoing peripheral ischemia who has had fasciotomies, you've got to think about it. So it, it was decided not to do anything at that point. A day later, so now we're on the 19th of December last year, uh, and you can see here, this is a scanogram of the patient when he's undergoing his CT scan. You can see he's got extensive uh, bowel dilation. This is a worry because this wasn't there before. You know, and when I look at this image, my first concern is, has the patient got mesenteric ischemia? Then you look at the celiac axis, you see how critically stenosed it is. Here you can see the, this is the same CT scan. The stenosis has gotten worse than it was previously. This is the SMA, significant compression of the true lumen. And then if we follow the aorta, look at this true lumen compression, significant compression of the true lumen, IMA, either thrombosed or very slow flow, and the iliacs significantly compromised as well. So this patient is now an extremist. They have bowel ischemia and they have ongoing peripheral vascular ischemia. So you need to do something. Uh, and so you can see the CT scan again, nothing much has changed except for the degree of mesenteric uh, stenosis. So like I said, what are your considerations here? Well, the first thing you need to consider is how much aorta should I cover? Because this patient is in the acute phase and the more aorta you cover, the more likely they are to develop a spinal cord ischemia. How do you size in a dissected arch? And do you put dissection stents in the aortic arch? Uh, and so this is what we did. So you can see here, this is um, a, a shot of dissection stents. So these are uncovered stents, which I'll talk about later. These are uncovered stents that we put across the aortic arch into, we landed in surgical graft. So down here, we're in surgical graft, and this is an uncovered stent. And the reason that we wanted to do this is just to essentially scaffold open the dissection across the arch vessels. And what we didn't want to do is put a covered stent distal to the subclavian and potentially pressurize that false lumen and, uh, and then cause compromise of the arch vessel. So we put uncovered stents across the arch, which is a off-label use, I'm going to add. It is not recommended at all by the manufacturer, but this patient, again, is in extremis. We put dissection stents across the arch all the way down to bifurcation. So these are all uncovered stents. But you can see already, you know, if you, if you take a, a picture in your head of what the aortic lumen looked like before, look how these stents have already started to open up that true lumen. Uh, and then up, we put in a covered stent just from distal to the left uh, common carotid artery origin. We did not oversize it at all. It was measured according to the true lumen because you didn't want to pressurize the false lumen. And the point and the aim of these procedures with acute malperfusion is just to restore flow into the true lumen. So you're not trying to do anything fancy. You're literally trying to get these patients off the table as quick as possible. And then we put balloon expandable stents into the celiac and the SMA just to open those up because again, you could see how compromised they were. And this is the dissection stent opening up across that aortic arch. And you can see as it opens, 
it, uh, it expands that true lumen. And so now I'm not, a lot more confident that when I put the, in the covered stent from distal to the carotid, that I'm not gonna pressurize and extend the dissection into my arch vessels. This is a very fast loop, just showing um, very little flow into the visceral vessels. This is not uncommon in very extensive dissections. And what you need to do then is you need to go and uh, look for the uh, branches and then branch stent them. So you can see here, there's a stent in the celiac, there's a stent in the SMA. The renals actually are perfusing. You just don't see them well. It's a very fast angiogram. But uh, on here, you almost see no, well, you see no perfusion in the celiac and the SMA. As soon as I stent them, really good perfusion. And then now you see the kidneys uh, perfusing. And then if you look, this is the CT scan post-intervention. And what I've done is I've got side-by-side -side images. This is the true lumen in the descending thoracic aorta. And this is a post, remember these are dissection stents. These aren't even covered stents, but look how the true lumen opens up just with these low radial force dissection stents and how much the, uh, the iliacs open as well. So now what you're seeing here in this image is dissection stents across the arch, a covered stent, um, and then because it's opposed one to one, there's still residual flow in the true lumen, but in the false lumen, I mean. And I'm not worried about that because this, this patient is malperfusing. We need to get them reperfusing properly as soon as possible. And so you can see it here. Uh, this is a volume rendered image showing the dissection stents across the aortic arch all the way down to the bifurcation, one single covered stent just in the proximal descending thoracic aorta, and then uh, the two stents in the celiac and the SMA. So this patient was then woken up 24 hours after our intervention, no neurological deficit, so clearly putting that dissection stent in hopefully helped somewhat. Uh, he had acute kidney injury, but again, he had been malperfusing for a long time, but no bowel ischemia, which is important. And so just to end off, what do you do when you have a complex dissection with malperfusion where it involves the ascending aorta? And so this is an option. This is a hybrid graft. And what this is, it's a combination of an endovascular graft that you put into the descending aorta that is then manufactured onto a surgical graft that you then surgically anastomose to the aortic root. And then you reimplant all of your arch vessels onto the surgical graft. And what this allows you to do is almost a one-stage procedure where you reestablish flow into the true lumen with that covered endovascular graft that you essentially deploy first. So this deploys from back to front, actually. So what you do is you open the aorta and uh, under direct vision, you put the uh, stent down, you deploy it in the thoracic aorta. You then have a very long redundant surgical graft, which you can then cut to size to anastomose to the aortic root. And this is kind of what a plan looks like. Uh, you can see that there's uh, a graft with some uh, stents on it, which is the endovascular T-var portion of it. And then in front of it is essentially just material that you can essentially ask to be made any length. And it can be 30 millimeters, can be you know, 200 millimeters if you want, and then you just cut it down in the procedure. So it's loaded backwards. So the distal end comes out first. And so the point is that this is an anti-grade deployment. So you do this under direct vision over a wire down into the uh, thoracic aorta, you deploy it, you then left with a surgical graft proximally that then you can then reanastomose to the aortic root. And so this is the petticoat technique that I was talking about, where you use a combination of a stent graft and an uncovered stent to essentially scaffold open the whole aorta. And what the uncovered stents do is they preserve intercostals, they allow you to stent across the visceral vessels like you saw I did in that case, uh, and you can re-intervene as you need to. And this is what they look like. They only come in two sizes, either 36 or 46 diameter. They low radial force. And you size these according to the stent graft that you're deploying. So for example, in the, in the uh, case that I showed you, the ascending aortic surgical graft was 22 millimeters, 23 millimeters. So I deployed a 36, but if it was say it was 38 millimeters, I would deploy a 46. So you size it according to the graft. That you're landing in. And this is what it looks like uh, on camera. This is from a, a paper published in cardiothoracic surgery. You can see as you deploy those uncovered stents, how it really opens up that true lumen. And there is some data here. It is uh, two different studies looking at reintervention rates and also a re expansion and, and remodeling of the aorta using a combination of uh, covered stents and then uh, bare metal stents or dissection stents, as we call them, all the way down to the aortic bifurcation. Thank you.